anyone says that so and so candidate is God, you put him to the test of Surah Khlas. Say it Allah one only. And the test of the Hindu scriptures. Ekkam evidityam. There's only one God without a second. Let's discuss the concept of messengers in Hinduism. The common Hindus, they have a different concept. They believe in avatars. The Vedas speak about saintly men, about rishis who Almighty God has sent to guide the humankind. This is exactly the same as the Islamic concept that Almighty God chooses a man amongst men and communicates with them on a higher level. And these men who Allah has sent to guide the human beings are called as messengers or prophets of Almighty God. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been prophesied as Ahmad in several places in the Vedas. Last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He's been referred as the last Rishi, Antim Rishi, the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Let's discuss the fifth pillar of Iman, that is believing in life after death, believing in the year after. First, we'll discuss life after death in Hinduism. The common Hindu, he believes in the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, known as samsara, the theory of reincarnation. And this theory of reincarnation says that Almighty God has created different people in different ways. Some are born rich, some are born poor, some are born healthy, some are born with some congenital defect. So how could God be unjust in making different people born in different ways? So they came out with the theory of samsara, also known as theory of reincarnation or transmigration of soul. Based on the verse of Bhagavad Gita, chapter number two, verse number 22, which says, whenever a person changes his clothes and wears new clothes, it is somewhat similar, like a soul gives away the body and enters new body. It believes in the theory of karma. The actions that you do are the karma. If you do good actions, you'll be rewarded in this world or the hereafter. If you do bad actions, you'll get a punishment. They also believe in the theory of dharma. Dharma means a person should live life according to the guidance of Almighty God. If you do good dharma, then your karma also will be good. And they believe in moksha. That means free from the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. If you analyze that this concept of transmigration of soul or samsara is no way mentioned in the Vedas. What the Vedas speak is about the Punar Janam. Punar means next or again. Janam means life. So Punar Janam means next life or life again. It doesn't mean life, death, and life again. It's not cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. It's only next life or life again. So the Hindu scholars who believe in the Vedas, they say that the concept of transmigration of soul was never mentioned in the Vedas. It came into existence later on. What is mentioned in the Vedas, if you read Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 16, verse number 4 and 5, it speaks about the next life and also says you will go to paradise, but doesn't speak about death, life and death. Further, if you analyze the Vedas and the other Hindu scriptures, they talk about swarg, about heaven, and describe heaven that it is a very beautiful place where rivers will flow. There will be rivers flowing of milk, and there will be various fruits. It will be a place which is good. It even talks in several places in the Vedas, in Atharva Ved, in Rig Ved. The Vedas even speak about Narak, that is hell. The description is somewhat like fire. And it says that this fire of hell will be bad, and a person won't be able to bear the pain in hell. So the concept of hell and heaven is there. But the concept of death, birth, and death is not there anywhere in the Vedas. Because the human being, the scholars, they could not know how could some people be born healthy, some people born with congenital defect. So because of this, we find that this concept has come about the birth, death, and rebirth. Let's discuss life after death in Islam. 
And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 28. Don't you know that you were dead and he gave you life and then caused you to die and then we again resurrected you? Your resurrection, by Allah mentioned in the Quran, is you come in this world only once. And again you're resurrected. And Allah says in the Quran, in chapter 67, verse number two, that Allah khalaq al mawta wal hayata. It is Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good indeed. This life is a test for the hereafter. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number 185, Allah says that Kullu nafsin zaykat al maut. Every soul shall have a taste of death. The final recompense is on the day of judgment. And those who save from the hellfire and get guarded in the life, they will achieve the objectives of this world. For this world is nothing but mere amusement and chattels of deception. The description of heaven is given in the Quran. It describes that there are many rivers in the heaven. There are rivers of milk and there will be various fruits. It is a very beautiful place. And Quran also describes about the hellfire. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 24, about the description of hell. And if we analyze in the Quran, as compared to Hinduism, it doesn't have a philosophy that life, death, and life again. Because some people are born rich, some people are born poor, some people are born with health, some people with congenital defect. Allah says that this life, different people have different tests. And depending upon different tests, the life will keep on changing. Let's discuss the sixth pillar of Islam. The sixth pillar of Islam is destiny. It's Qadr. And Allah says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has certain things destined. For example, when a person is born, where will he die? When will he be born? How will he live? Like how the questions in the examination, it keeps on changing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already destined how will a person be born, how will he die? And this concept is the same even in Hindu scriptures that Almighty God has destined, He has assigned how will a human being live. This was in short the similarities between the six pillars of Iman and Hinduism. Let us discuss the various similarities between Islam and Hinduism. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number 90. Allah says, Ya Allah Amanu, O you believe, in Namal Khamru al Maisuru, most certainly intoxicants gambling, while Anzabul Aslamu, dedication of stone, the violation of arrows, rich to my shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. First, the Nibula Lokum to Flihun, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Allah says that intoxicant, gambling, the violation of arrows, all these are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. Let's analyze what do the Hindu scriptures have to say about these things. If you read, it's mentioned in Manu Smriti, chapter number 9, verse number 235. It says that a person who is a priest killer, who is a liquor drinker, and who is a person who lies on the marriage bed of the Guru, and who is a thief, all of them do major sins. And in Manu Smriti, chapter number 9, verse number 238, it says that all of these should be punished. And it says that these people, no one should talk to them, no one should sacrifice for them, no one should marry them, and all of these people should leave all the religion and should wander in the world. They should be excommunicated. That means anyone who has intoxicants, according to Manu Smriti, they should wander in the world and they should be excommunicated from all the religions. It is more strict than Islam. And if you read the Hindu scriptures, intoxicants had been prohibited in several places. If you read Manu Smriti, chapter number 11, verse number 55, it says that a person who drinks and a person who kills the priest, who steals and who sleeps on the marriage bed of the Guru, all of them 
all those who associate with them, all of them are major sinners. It's further mentioned that alcohol has been prohibited in Hindu scriptures in several places, including Manusmriti, chapter number 7, verse number 47, Manusmriti, chapter number 7, verse number 50, in Manusmriti, chapter number 9, verse number 225, in Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 2, verse number 12, in Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 21, verse number 14. In several places, the Hindu scriptures, they prohibit the having of intoxicants. Even gambling has been prohibited in Hindu scriptures in Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 34, verse number 3. It says that a person who gambles, his wife, he is left aloof. And his mother, they hate the gambler. And no one supports him. It's further mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 34, verse number 13. It says that do not play with the dice. Rather, you should do farming. If you do farming, even if you earn less money, it will be good for the hereafter. If you analyze the Hindu scriptures, they forbid for a person to gamble. It's mentioned in Manusmriti, chapter number 7, verse number 50. It says that a person who drinks, the person who gambles, a person who indulges with women and hunting, all of them, they are the most four major crimes that a person can do. Gambling has been prohibited in several places. In Manusmriti, chapter number 7, verse 47. In Manusmriti, chapter number 9, verse number 221 to 228. It's also mentioned in Manusmriti, chapter number 9, verse number 258. The Hindu scriptures also prohibit fortune telling. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90. Ya Lizina Amanu, O you believe. In Namal Khamru al Mysuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, while Anzabu al Aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rich to Manamli Shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. First animal alakum to flihun. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Gambling has been prohibited. Besides gambling and alcohol, even fortune telling has been prohibited. It's also prohibited in Manusmiti, chapter number 9, verse number 258, that all those who do fortune telling, they are doing a sin. And verse number 262 says that king should punish them according to the severity of the crime. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik Labbaik Allahumma labbaik Labbaik la sharika laka Labbaik la sharika laka Labbaik Inna alhamda Inna alhamda Wa ni'amata Wa ni'amata Laka wa al-mulk Laka wa al-mulk La sharika laka Wa lillahi al-asnao al-husna Fad'u'u biha Al Aziz, Al -Aziz. The, Almighty. the Almighty. Al Wadud, Al -Wadud. The, All the All Loving. Al Tawab, The Acceptor of Your Return. Al Razzaq, The Provider. Al-Raqib, the All-Watchful. Walillahi al-Asma'u al-Husna, to Allah belongs the beautiful names. Fad'u'hu biha, to call him upon them. To understand more of Allah's beautiful names, join me, your brother Majid Mahmoud, on my new series about understanding Allah's beautiful names on Peace TV. Allah la ilaha illa huwa lahu al-asma'u al-husna Allahu Allahu ya Don't miss the chance to comprehend the seamless explanation of Allah's beautiful names in understanding Allah's beautiful names today at 7 p.m. and repeat telecast at 12 p.m. India on Peace TV
dialogue dialogue discussion discussion debate 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 rebuttal rebuttal conclusion conclusion eliminate misconceptions about religion get enlightened witness dr zakir naik in a battle of words in crossfire tonight at 8:30 pm and repeat telecast at 10 am india on peace tv Allah also says in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 188 Allah says use not your wealth as a bait for judges in order you may eat other people's wealth bribing has been prohibited in the Quran even the Hindu scriptures in Manusmriti chapter number 9 verse number 258 that all those who bribe all those who deal in fraud all of them are major sinners and the punishment is mentioned in manus smith chapter number 9 verse 262 that the king will punish them depending upon the severity of the crime furthermore islam believes in polygamy and allah says in the quran in surah nisa chapter number 4 verse number 3 allah says that marry women of choice in twos threes or fours but if you can't do justice marry only one quran is the only religious book which says marry only one There is no other religious scripture on the face of the earth which says marry only one. All the other major religious scripture, if you read, no religious scripture says marry only one. If you read the Hindu scriptures, if you read Ramayan, it says that King Dashrath, the father of Ram, he had more than one wife. It's mentioned in Vishnu Sutra, chapter number twenty-four, verse number one, that a Brahmin can have four wives. If you read Mahabharat, Krishna, how many wives did he have? Krishna had 16,108 wives. So if Krishna can have 16,108 wives, so why can't we Muslims have up to four? If you analyze, the Hindu scriptures say a Hindu can marry as many wives as they want. It is the Indian government which has put a limitation. The Indian government has passed a law in 1954 called as the Hindu Marriage Act and says that a Hindu can only marry one wife. But the Hindu scriptures say that the Hindus can marry as many wives as they want. There's no upper limit. But the Indian government has put up a limit that they can only marry one. If you read the report of the Indian government of the status of women, it's mentioned on page number 66 and 67. It gives the statistics of the polygamous marriages done in a span of 10 years, from 1951 to 1961. And the Muslims have done 4.31 percent of polygamous marriages, and the Hindus have done. 5.06% polygamous marriages the reasons for polygamy has been mentioned my cassette on women's rights in islam this was in brief regarding the similarities between hinduism and islam you can keep on talking for us together and for the complete day but if you analyze because of the british rule we find that hinduism has gone down and especially the britishers they came to india to do business and they changed many of the religious beliefs of the hindus that's the reason late towards the 18th century and 19th century there was a surge of hindu reformers and the pioneer among the hindu reformers was the person by the name raja ram mohan roy raja ram mohan roy he was from bengal and he was born in 1772 and he preached that you should believe only in one god should not do idol worship he was against the caste system and he wrote a book in 1803 he learned persian english as well as arabic and in that book he condemned idol worship he said he does not even agree in the avatar and he started a new trust by the name of brahma samaj and this brahma samaj in the trust deed he writes that no sculpture no graven image no picture no painting no photograph should enter the building and later on there were many offshoots of the brahma samaj and all of them there the common teachings that almighty god is one he has got no images there are no idols of almighty god almighty god has got no avatar they were against idol worship and regarding believing 
in the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. This was optional. If you want, you can believe. If you don't want, you don't believe. The other great reformer, which was offshoot of Brahma Samaj, was Justice Ranade. Justice Ranade, he was the person who started the Pratna Samaj. I hope you are aware of Pratna Samaj. Are you aware of Pratna Samaj? Very good. You are aware of Pratna Samaj. How many of you know about Justice Ranade? How many of us? This person, he started an offshoot of Brahma Samaj and he even preached against caste system. He even preached that the widows, the women, they should remarry. He even preached that the women should be educated. The other great reformer among the Hindu was Swami Dayanand Saraswati. He started in 1875 the Arya Samaj and the three pundits, they are from Arya Samaj. What he said? That we should strictly follow the Vedas and we should not follow anything but the Vedas. Believe in one God, that you should not do idol worship, should not believe that God has got avatar. He started the Arya Samaj. We even have one more famous reformer by the name of Swami Vivekananda. He was the founder of Sri Ramakrishna Mission. And he said that Hinduism is a misnomer. We should call the followers as Vedantist. And he made Hinduism come into the Western world, where he gave a talk in Chicago in the Parliament of Religion. We find that many Hindu reformers were there. They tried to improve the teachings of Hinduism. And today we come to know from history that the Britishers, they had come to India to do business. They came to India about a few centuries back. They came for doing business, but they looted our country. They even ruled our country. And these Britishers, they changed the religious belief of the Indians. And these people, they saw to it that they changed the philosophy of Hinduism. So we find a surge of Hindu reformers, especially in the late 18th century and the 19th century. For example, as I mentioned, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, example of Vivekananda, example of Swami Dhanan Saraswati, Justice Anade. And these people, they were reformers. And people may wonder that all these things that I mentioned in my talk about the facts of Hinduism that I mentioned, they weren't concoction. But I received all these guidance about Hinduism from these great reformers, like Raja Ram Mohan Roy and Justice Anade. And after I read this book, these people are great scholars. I am just a student of comparative religion. I'm not a scholar. When I read the books of these scholars, I being a student of comparative religion, I don't take anything for granted. Whatever they said, I checked up whether are they available in the sacred scripture of the Hindus. And after verifying them, I have mentioned the facts of Hinduism while quoting the references of the Hindu scriptures. And all the facts are mentioned about Hinduism. I have also mentioned the references from the Vedas, as well as the other scriptures, like Upanishads, like Bhagavad Gita, etc. Those Hindus who strictly believe in the Vedas, they don't believe in any other scripture of Hinduism. So even if you remove all the other references of the Hindu scriptures, whatever references I've given, I have quoted the Vedas as well as the other scriptures. If you remove the references of the other scriptures, yet the message of Hinduism is the same. There are other Hindus Though they believe that Veda is the most sacred among the Hindu scriptures, but they even believe in the other scriptures and they more commonly read Bhagavad Gita, etc. That's the reason I've even quoted the Vedas, even the other Hindu scriptures. I have been enlightened by the great reformers of Hinduism. And from history we have come to know that the Britishers, they ruled India by having a philosophy of divide and rule. With this philosophy, they ruled India for several years. We, alhamdulillah, 
more than 50 years back, we have got the freedom of this country from the rule of the British. But unfortunately, we yet continue following the philosophy of the Britishers of divide and rule. And we have examples that most of the Indian politicians, they follow the philosophy of the Britishers and they have the philosophy of divide and rule for the vote banks. And we find that in this country of ours, the maximum rights in any country of the world, it's in India. And the cause that these politicians, they instigate these rights. They follow the philosophy of divide and rule. And many people say that the politicians, they add fuel to the fire. I disagree. The politicians of India, they don't add fuel to the fire. These people, they add fire to the fuel. We know that the fuel is used for constructive work, for vehicles, for factories, for upliftment of India. But these people, they add fire to the fuel and they cause the destruction of India. All the politicians aren't like that. But most of them, they add fire to the fuel. And they use it as a vote bank. Most of them, if not all, irrespective whether they're Hindu politicians, Muslim politicians, or Christian politicians.